It's packed with the most unstoppable assassin action yet, but how will fans feel about the nearly three-hour runtime? Here's the best and worst things about John Wick Chapter 4. One element of the John Wick series that can prove divisive is the way it handles pedestrians. Shootouts and fight scenes throughout the franchise often take place in crowded locations packed with extras, but all these onlookers never react to the bloodshed happening right in front of them. This isn't an issue in the first film, but all of the sequels take a more heightened reality approach to the crowds of civilians. Several people can get gunned down close enough to them to be in the splash zone, and the civilians will just keep on dancing to the music even as bullets fly. For some, this is part of the campy fun of the series. For others, it is one step too far removed from reality to avoid breaking immersion and making the world feel artificial. It can begin to seem like there are no normal people in the world of John Wick, and that everyone is an assassin or works alongside assassins in the underworld. John Wick Chapter 4 and the other sequels would benefit from the inclusion of more characters outside of the assassination game to provide contrast. John Wick's deceased wife Helen and Kane's daughter Mia are normal civilians, but neither of them has a real presence. This issue makes it harder to buy into the world of John Wick as a functioning society with each sequel. Amen. After the relatively straightforward and simple first movie, the settings and backdrops of the John Wick sequels have all been impressive, varied, and well integrated into the action set pieces. Chapter 4 raises the bar in stunning fashion by turning the plot into a full-fledged, globe-spanning adventure. New York City remains an important location in this latest outing. However, the plot also finds John Wick returning to the Sahara Desert of Chapter 3 to visit the Elder, as well as traveling to Osaka, Berlin, and even Paris for the showdown with the Marquis. Adding to the effectiveness of the locations themselves is the way in which they are shot. The prior John Wick movies are no slouches when it comes to their visual aesthetics, but Chapter 4 arguably has the best cinematography of the bunch. The change from the steely, muted color palette of the first movie to the increasingly more colorful sequels is also a welcome progression. The first three movies mostly line up when it comes to the rules of the universe, but Chapter 4 changes a few things up and asks you to turn a blind eye to the discrepancies. These issues might have something to do with the original screenwriter Derek Kolstad being completely uninvolved with Chapter 4 for the first time in the history of the series. One of the biggest inconsistencies is how easy it is for John to travel this time around. A huge part of Chapter 3 is devoted to his struggle to get from New York City to Casablanca. This requires him to secure passage from the Resca Roma, which involves them tearing his ticket for a one-way trip. In Chapter 4, John Wick makes the same international journey off-screen, with no mind paid to how he gets there. He travels around the world without any difficulty, despite the bounty on his head being significantly higher than ever before. It is also unclear why John needs to go to Berlin to get the support of the Ruska Roma after he previously met at their headquarters in New York City. The complete absence of the director is especially conspicuous when she seems like the perfect person to solve John's specific problem. The John Wick movies always have strong soundtracks, mixing the series' original score by Taylor Bates and Joel J. Richard with pre-existing music to great effect. Though there are plenty of memorable needle-drop moments in the previous films, Chapter 4 has arguably the best overall soundtrack of the entire series. Bates and Richard return as the main composers and reprise the familiar themes while ensuring the music continues to evolve and feel fresh. The needle-drop moments between the original score are a cut above the already high bar set by the series. Fans of French electronic music will be especially thrilled as tracks from popular artists like Gessa Falstein and Justice show up. One of the best musical moments in the entire film is actually a reprise of a song first utilized in the original John Wick. The song LED Spirals by Lee Castlevania makes a welcome return to the soundtrack of Chapter 4. After previously scoring the centerpiece shootout that takes place in the Red Circle nightclub in the first movie. If there is anything that hurts the action of John Wick Chapter 4, it is that John feels a bit too invincible at times. Part of the joy of the first John Wick is how much pain he suffered and how wounded he was by the end, and yet still came out on top. Giving John a bulletproof suit in Chapter 2 runs a risk of making him too indestructible, but the film finds a way to balance the scales and keeps the sense of danger intact. By Chapter 4, John begins to feel a bit too superhuman. It really only becomes a major distraction when it comes to the multiple two to three story falls he takes and bounces back from like they're nothing. These land in stark contrast to the fall he takes from the roof of the Continental at the end of Chapter 3, which requires substantial time to rest and recover before he's ready to fight again. John takes two huge falls of a comparable size in Chapter 4, not to mention the various other hits, stabs, gunshots, and hundreds of stairs that he falls down. Yet he hardly bats an eye at all the physical trauma this time around. The stakes of the action feel a little lower as a result, though the very end of the film course corrects for the better. 
The John Wick series is almost as much about dogs as it is about action. The murder of John's puppy in the original film is, of course, the straw that breaks the camel's back and kicks off his quest for vengeance. Each subsequent movie keeps canines as a part of the series' DNA. In Chapter 4, a new dog is brought into the action, owned by the tracker, aka Mr. Nobody. We see this dog in some creative new ways, like running and leaping across the tops of cars in a shootout set in front of the Arc de Triomphe. The best moment involving the dog is actually a choice made by John. Though the dog and Mr. Nobody have been trying to kill him, John saves the dog when she is about to be killed. It is a perfect moment of redemption for John after what happened to Daisy all the way back in the first movie. John Wick Chapter 3 ends with a massive cliffhanger. After throwing away the freedom he earned from the high table to defend Winston, John is double-crossed. Winston shoots him and sends him off the roof of the Continental. The first three John Wick movies all take place within a short time span, each one beginning right after the previous one ended. For the first time, Chapter 4 picks up following an extended gap in time after John and the Bowery King are both fully healed. Once John is back in action, he only has his sights set on the high table, not on Winston. When the two do cross paths, John lets Winston off the hook extremely easily, and the two become chummy again and spend the rest of the film working together. The promised vengeance against Winston never happens, nor does Winston ever truly reckon with his act of betrayal. This is particularly hard to buy, given that one of John's defining character traits is that he can't let things go and always needs to settle the score. What have you done? Chapter 4 brings a focus back to John's deceased wife, Helen, in key moments that are quite effective and help make the series feel like it is coming full circle. Her presence is less prominent than in the first movie, but far more impactful than it is in the other sequels. In one key scene, John lights a candle and pays his respects to her before having a friendly conversation with Kane about why. John says he doesn't believe she can hear him or feel his presence, but he does it anyway because he could be wrong. John's most vulnerable and human moment in the entire film arrives when he tells Winston that he wants his epitaph to read Loving Husband. He's an infamous assassin with a legendary reputation, yet he only wants to be remembered in relation to Helen. And finally, the quick flash of Helen in John's dying moments is a beautiful way to tie it all together and provide a fitting conclusion to Mr. Wick's journey. The first John Wick movie and its first sequel give John a clear goal to work toward in typically violent fashion. Chapter 3 is the first time where John's motivation starts to falter, but Chapter 4 is a step down in the motivation department, as John doesn't really have a good reason for the bloodshed at all this time around. Other characters say as such within the film. Winston tells John that what he's doing is pointless and won't accomplish anything, and he's right. The Marquis calls John a man with nothing to live for, nothing to die for, and nothing to kill for, and he's also right. The film embraces emptiness in John, but it is a genuine problem with the central figure. John barely feels like a character anymore in Chapter 4, and it's mostly just a vessel for other characters to exploit, try to kill, and get killed by. I'm going to need a gun. John Wick Chapter 4 introduces many new characters to the series, and they are all great. Chidi, Akira, The Harbinger, Chimazu, The Tracker, Marquis, and especially Kane are all fantastic additions to the John Wick world. Kane even steals the show from John Wick and nearly begins to feel like the main character himself at points, as he takes center stage for stretches where John is absent. The post credit scene teases that he actually might become the protagonist of his own spin-off at some point in the franchise's future, which sounds fantastic in theory. Each film in the John Wick series has gotten progressively longer, but the biggest leap comes to John Wick Chapter 4. This new installment is nearly three hours long. On the plus side, the longer runtime means more action, and the film fully delivers in that category. All the same, the hefty length is a clear hindrance. Too much of a good thing can still become exhausting. The extended Berlin portion of the plot of Chapter 4 is where the length is the most problematic. This segment of the film is well made, but does not feel like an integral part of the overall story. A new villain is introduced and immediately killed off in the form of Killer, a fun character who unfortunately has no real purpose in the story. The entire Berlin sequence could theoretically be left on the cutting room floor without affecting the story, and the overall film would be much tighter and better paced as a result. It would also lose a couple of new characters, which would help Chapter 4 feel less overstuffed. It should come as no surprise whatsoever that the best part of John Wick Chapter 4 by far is the action. Every John Wick movie has had to raise the bar and find new ways to showcase Mr. Wick's lethal skill set. Chapter 4 continues to expand the styles of action on offer by incorporating exciting new weapons like nunchucks and bows and arrows, and by making one of its main players, Kane, a blind assassin with a unique fighting style. The introduction of Dragon's Breath shotgun shells for one spectacular sequence is a fiery way to raise the shootout bar higher than it has ever been 
been before. Chapter 4 has some shortcomings in the writing department, but they are easy to overlook when the action is so incredible. 